Consensus Lab is basically uh, dedicated to uh, building consensus protocols for Web3. So what, what's Web3? If we go from the inception of the internet in the 60s to Web 1.0, that was basically posting read-only content by, by those people who knew how to post uh, the content, to Web 2.0, which we have now with different social networks, uh, clouds, and so on. But where we have data basically siloed in mostly centralized cloud provider, there is a wonderful SIGCOM paper uh, this year, best SIGCOM paper in 2021, that says that half of the internet traffic is basically governed by five institutions. And Web3 is going to towards decentralization, right? So decentralization in a sense, and I will define uh, decentralization in more, more details later during this talk. Uh, but this is basically a set of computer systems and set of computer programs that basically build uh, decentralized internet uh, in a way such that you don't trust in, in principle any single component. And this is what is emerging today. And Consensus Lab is essentially looking into building a layer of strong consistency and a bit weaker consistency is also also in the scope of uh, of uh, consensus lab that power that would power and that would act as a backbone of uh, of web3 so this is uh, this is the best i could do for a one slide goals and visions so consensus lab is supposed to be a go to place for scalable consensus and decentralized systems r and d uh, so yes, we are part of protocol labs and yes, one of our goals is to impact uh, Filecoin and IPFS uh, ecosystems. As you know, one of the uh, protocol labs has several projects, but one of the most well-known ones are Filecoin, uh, which is incentivized content addressable storage and IPFS, which is uh, the same, but without incentives. And there are several other protocols. And there is a lot of Web3, pro uh, Web3 projects that is actually using uh, Filecoin, IPFS, uh, but also DRAN, uh, Lib P2P, and many other projects that come from protocol labs. Uh, so Pro Consensus Lab is definitely dedicated for impact in Filecoin and IPFS, but also the entire Web3 ecosystem. But part of it is actually collaborating with academia. And there are many, my, many friends, uh, ex-collaborators, and I hope future collaborators here on this call today and among the registrants who were basically the, the, the target audience for this event, right? And we plan in Consensus Lab to foster collaboration in academia and other Web3 projects through different grants, like more, these, are, these would be more classical funding schemes, but what we are also keen uh, looking into and very much interested in are decentralized funding and incentive schemes uh, of which there will be talks in the following months from PL, but also we might, uh, scratch the surface of these discussions during the panel. Uh, Consensus Lab as protocol labs is working in the open. So there are no, not necessarily, I wouldn't say not exclusively, but not necessarily patents, right? So we are not interested in patents. We are interested in open source. We are interested in uh, sharing the knowledge and the code among different projects and different people and basically building the decentralized uh, uh, Web3 together. Uh, in the Consensus Lab, we are going to have this is not going to grow to hundreds of people, right? So uh, as you will see, Consensus Lab uh, does grow fairly fast. So I joined in the end of June, uh, 2021. So end of this year, July, so maybe three months ago. And we are growing pretty fast, but we are going to stop growing at some point, right? So the members of Consensus Lab are essentially uh, going to do also what I'm trying to do. And you know, in discussions with many of you, I, I also mentioned this. This is trying to leverage our connections and, and, and our collaborations with the, with the academia to basically build together uh, and also incentivize this collaboration uh, for building together this decentralized uh, consensus for decentralized web. Uh, so it's really, uh, we are looking for the impact beyond Filecoin ecosystem for the entire web three and maybe reinventing the whole collaboration uh, in the open. So this goes in the direction of, of the Thing I mentioned towards, for example, changing the, even the peer review systems uh, later on uh, and things like that. We'll discuss this. This is just the beginning. So just to give you a flavor of where we are going. Uh, more technically, so this was on a higher level, but more technically, if you look at decentralized systems today, consensus is the bottleneck, right? Uh, there are two things about consensus. So if you have basically here, I borrowed the next two slides from Juan Stokes. Uh, where he describes uh, basically the problems that motivate uh, formation of consensus lab in protocol labs is that they're like the distributed application potential today is very, very high and, and the hopes are high. But basically when you channel this through consensus protocols and they're more efficient protocols than the one that I mentioned here, but classical ones are Bitcoin, 
with seven transactions per second and Ethereum with 15 to 30 transactions per second. Uh, basically, but these total order services, if you perceive them like that, they're most of the time bottlenecks in the system. And depending on your goals, you can put even the best consensus protocol and it's still going to you know, perform at, a, at a, uh, basically how a single machine performs, right? Unless you do something else. Uh, so that's one. So one thing is about uh, sequencing the transactions and basically establishing total order and, and addressing these bottlenecks. But the other is also tra transactional smart contract execution. So we see in smart contract uh, systems such as Ethereum, the smart contract execution is sequential from distributed systems, uh, uh, basically decades of research, we know how to, or we have an idea how to address parallel execution in centralized system where you don't have the difficulty of not trusting other nodes in the system, but, but, but this is also a problem. So if you split this into ordering and execution, there is a problem here. In my previous work, which I didn't cite here, you know, I, I kind of, inside IBM, inside the IBM teams, we tackle this in the context of permission systems, such as hyperledger fabric, but in principle, in permissionless system, the situation is much more complicated. And we're looking at the same problems here again, right? Uh, but what are the requirements? Okay, so like what, what are the use cases and what's, what are we optimizing for if you want? And there, you know, when I, when, I joined, when I had an idea to join Protocol Labs, I was like, okay, we are going to apply some really, uh, I was recently working to, for, on, on, on efficient high throughput protocols. I know other people, other groups who are working on highly efficient protocols. We are going to implement really nice scalable consensus and we are mostly done. Well, except that, uh, Juan had this nice idea, which he really liked, which is, okay, let's, let's, let's forget about a single blockchain. Let's talk about uh, Web3 requirements as of porting Web2 workloads to Web3. And then suddenly you talk about billions of transactions per second. You talk in some use cases, you talk about, you know, data center uh, latency, so millis millisecond or tens of milliseconds finality, depending on what is the application doing? Then you might be talking about earth consensus or the, like the city or the uh, you know, urban area consensus or so on. But you still want to have, like unlike in uh, web two, unlike in centralized internet and centralized cloud computing, you want to have this security against nation states attackers. Uh, for example, the Bitcoin has and, and so on, right? So if you have this bunch of goals, then you need to look at the problem a bit, a bit differently, right? And this, this bunch of goals motivated basically how I view what consensus lab should be doing and how we structure work in consensus lab. So how do we get there? It's clear kind of, if you're looking at the billion transactions of second, that one of the key problems is not going to be the scale only to scale a consensus, uh, a single consensus protocol. So if you look at the, each of these lines and these circles as a single blockchain namespace or the, or the state space, uh, or you can call it a shard, then you will be talking about multi-sharded system that of course has its own, we know this from distributed systems for a long time, has its problems in the context of decentralized system security related problems, but also consistency related problems. Like what happens to cross shard transactions? And for example, if you are sampling the membership of a parent shard into a child shard, how do you protect against the attacks of the power dilution and so on? Uh, but you might not be sampling uh, you know, just, just, just the, you might not be partitioning the state, but you might be looking into some other, uh, some other things. And we'll have some inter very interesting talks uh, just after my talk uh, during the sharding session about this. But we are certainly not looking into a single blockchain system. I think we can agree on this. Uh, then depending on a particular shard, you're not looking into a single consensus protocol either. So ideally we don't want thousands of consensus protocols because currently, I mean, I can only, mention a few that are production ready, right? So they don't halt, uh, will not name uh, particular blockchains that halted recently, but there are many implementations that just halt for some reason that are not proven. And in the industry, there's just several uh, projects that are, that are really proven when it comes to consensus implementation. So we are not going to expect thousands of those, but we are going to expect a few of those and they're probably going to differ, uh, maybe not, Right, but currently as the current design goes, they differ with respect to number of nodes. So you have different design choices. For example, with less than 100 nodes, you would you know, go with a single, with a, with a certain family of protocols. If you have tens of thousands of nodes, you might go more to run, towards randomization and so on, right? I'm not saying we should go that way, by, by the way, for these techniques, but I'm just illustrating what's the case today. 
but then again, for individual implementations inside the shards, then you have you know, a separate set of challenges. So what is the performance? What are the trade-offs? What is the security? How do you, you know, do civil attack protection and so on? How do you prove things correct? So, you know, we are we talking about formal verification, model checking? Are we talking about distributed testing? Uh, how this how is this done? And this is all something that's like the research is there, but when it comes to production and powering, if you imagine powering uh, systems at the scale of Web two, we don't have production protocols that are at the level of similar uh, systems that power Web two, for example. And, you know, classical strongly consistent systems that we use in crash fault tolerance, for example. And the third thing is uh, this execution, right, that we mentioned earlier. So, of course, if you have whatever we build uh, in the first two pillars, I would say, and if you have then, then sequential execution, the way it's mostly done today, this is not going to go far, right? So we are going to have to look at parallel execution, maybe even computation, computation over arbitrary data. One thing to think about there is, uh, you know, if you do federated machine learning, where you don't have the machine learning data siloed inside a, inside a single data center in, in control of a single, let's say, social network provider, how do you do this, right? In, in, especially if you couple it with, uh, with encryption and, and privacy, which I'm not focusing on, by the way, this, this is what I should mention. So there, uh, Consensus Lab is one of the four groups that are looking in deeply into these uh, uh, bringing cutting edge research to development uh, uh, areas. So we are looking into basically what I'm discussing now, but we have uh, uh, three other groups that are looking uh, into more like zero topics like zero knowledge computing or uh, just applications of different uh, uh, cryptographic primitives to blockchain. And uh, one group looks at crypto economics, so more from a game theory perspective. Of course, we work together. Like I cannot look at these problems that I'm, that I'm showing here without considering those. Uh, but I'm focusing on these now, right? So just do, that you don't think that I forgot uh, other things to mention here. Uh, there is also the need to support, uh, I don't know, WebAssembly uh, virtual machines, maybe Ethereum virtual machines, maybe some other virtual machines, right? So if you write, write uh, so-called smart contract instead of uh, simple cri cryptocurrency transfers, the situation gets complicated, right? And we got that far basically in the, as, as things stand today, but there is a lot of work to be done. And essentially Consensus Lab is focusing on these three things. So we are dividing our work, we are building, a, you know, we are building single systems and we are interested in basically building these systems together with, again, uh, with, uh, with other partners, as I mentioned before, uh, but focusing on these things, right? And these are the three vertical pillars of Consensus Lab, but then you see basically in red, some challenges define uh, horizontally uh, relevant topics that, that, that basically are relevant to all three pillars. These include security, which is pervasive. Also, how do we implement things correctly? How do we prove them correctly? This is also pervasive if the interest of cons for Consensus Lab and so on. So essentially, this also covers uh, many of the sessions that are, that are uh, Consensus Day sessions today and tomorrow. Uh, and I'm very happy that basically we got such a response from the community. So all the papers that we got were extremely relevant. I don't know if there was one or two exceptions that was not relevant to what we as a consensus lab are, are looking into. So that, that was really great. Uh, consensus lab takes this perspective of connecting the dots approach. So again, because it's about web, bringing web two workloads to web three, the idea is not to look at uh, these problems from the perspective of a single blockchain project. So it's not about here, uh, you know, scaling uh, Filecoin consensus, but it's really like, okay, can we think about the whole space, the whole blockchain, whole decentralized system space and build uh, an engineer system such that, for example, you reuse uh, things that are built by, uh, by separate, uh, by, by different teams. And my impression of the current situation when I was moving from permission world to permissionless world is that Web3 projects largely, not exclusively, right? Protocol Labs is working a lot on collaboration across different teams, but largely they are, you know, they appear as islands of, of research and development among maybe competing teams, you know, whose blockchain has more transactions per second and so on. So I think we should need to step, take a step back and basically 
look at like imagine that you're a systems engineer each of us is a system engineer that's supposed to build decentralized internet himself like how would you think about the problem and of course then later on you wouldn't build a decentralized internet yourself but we will collaborate that's that's by the way the challenge that we're going to talk about how do we do it but this is the thing right so you're not building a single blockchain you're like how how would you change the world how, how would you put uh, all things together how would you connect the dots and that's the approach that we would like to emphasize and that we'd like to work towards so in this context, uh, I would like to also take a step back to look what we have done so far and to have a look, especially from the consensus perspective, like what's there today and what do we have and what, what can we use in, a, in, a, in a which way. So basically, this needs to start from proof of work, right? So we cannot uh, avoid elephant in the room. And... Uh, as we were kind of trying to improve certain things that you see in red here, that, that are normally seen as drawbacks, uh, then we were you know, going more towards Byzantine fault tolerance and proof of stake protocols. So Byzantine fault tolerance was something that exists for 40 years. So I did my PhD actually, I started my PhD 18 years ago on Byzantine fault tolerance consensus. I, I defended my thesis one month before launching of Bitcoin. So it, this was there. I mean, these, these protocols were there. They were not as advanced as today, but they were there. But they were, for some reason, they were not deployed. And as we'll see, there are certain reasons why this is the case and this is why this is still the case. Uh, but proof of work, I mean, it has very high energy consumption. This is, this is undebatable, right? So currently it's larger than Poland. It's 0.1% of world's energy production. And the consensus itself, if you look at it from the computer science perspective, I mean, the guarantees are not much, right? So the throughput is not much, the latency is not much. I mean, it's much, it's, it's a lot, but you know, it's not very good. And uh, there is no finality, right? So depending on your perspective, you can, certain things are actually good, but we need to see like in this progress of replacing proof of work, like how far did we get? And we got some new applications, right? So we got smart contracts, we got decentralized finance, but what we also got is a, probably a huge confusion on the market. So I, this, I did a snapshot of coin market cap today, and this lists 12,000 cryptocurrencies. So the question is, are these all decentralized? Are these all useful? Can we, you know, what, what do we do with this? Like, what are we building here? And here in a recent paper that, uh, I had, uh, so I'm really, really thankful for giving this call. I would like to thank Stefan Schmidt and Seth Gilbert for inviting uh, this position paper that I wrote for Bulletin of the European Association for Theoretical Computer Science, Distributed Computing Column. It appears this month. And I have uh, basically looked at these things that also I needed to look at to position basically my view of how Consensus Lab should continue uh, research. So this includes like, what is Bitcoin actually doing? And is it sustainable in what, what it is doing? How do we define decentralization? And are we trading in some key properties in this quest for green, very efficient performance? Are, are we doing something that we shouldn't be doing? So the rest, like 15 minutes are about these topics, right? So in that position paper, I went briefly to see how, because there was no, uh, I had an impression that there was no consensus in how do we define decentralization. Then I found a nice pets paper by Carmela Trogozo, uh, and others, there was George and Danesis, Harry Halfin, and I'm skipping one, one other uh, author, I'm sorry. So, which defines very broadly decentralized systems as a subset of distributed systems, and I like this definition, I think it's very good, uh, where multiple authorities control different components, but no one is fully trusted by all. So I think this is a basic definition. I think if, if, a, if, a, decent, if a system, if a distributed system doesn't satisfy this definition, we shouldn't call it decentralized. This is what I firmly believe. Uh, but then again, it doesn't dis distinguish like global scale permissionless systems such as Bitcoin from a four node, you know, organ organization of four organizations which run a BFT protocol. So we need other facets of decentralization. And then in the literature, there are several of them, right? So there is resilience, which we know from fault tolerant computing. This is our typical F or T. In blockchain world, it's typically called Nakamoto coefficient. It's, it's basically the same thing. Like how many authorities the adversary needs to compromise to subvert safety of life or liveness. This is our, again, F or T in the classical system. Uh, other decentralization facets include like governance, you know, is somebody who controls the, the updates to the software, how easy it is to submit proposals and so on. So this should be like, there are certain parameters that I won't go have go time 
to go in, but uh, in, in, in my paper, there are some pointers, including to certain other papers that go in even in more depth. Whether protocols has uh, in protocol incentives, like is it incentivizing participation from uh, inside the protocol by giving, for example, uh, re block rewards or transaction fees and so on. And there are certain aspects that, uh, that I'm not focusing on, but it, which, is, which is very important. So we saw this with the outage of a certain uh, famous social network yesterday. So I like to hear network level is always important, right? So we cannot forget that. But since we are just, just to focus on more distributed systems aspect, then we are focusing on, on these facets that are, that are in black, right? So one very known one is openness, like whether the system is permissionless or permission. And here we have a classical definition that permissionless systems are roughly speaking in English, those in which anyone can participate. So participants essentially self-elect themselves into the system. And in permission systems, there is an authority, you know, the centralized uh, authority or maybe decentralized, maybe existing members let new members come into the system. This is also possible, which elects participants. And normally we would say that permissionless systems are more decentralized than permission, right? But is this classification expressive enough? So for example, are all permissionless systems equally decentralized? And then uh, basically what I proposed in that paper is a refinement of notion of permissionless, permissionlessness, if I may put it like that. So this is called equal opportunity as inclusiveness. So I, I was lazy enough to copy paste the definition here, but there are essentially two properties that a system which satisfies inclusiveness or provides equal opportunities needs to satisfy needs to satisfy resource symmetry and genuine openness. So resource symmetry says just if me and George bring uh, same resources to the system, we'll actually have the same power, roughly speaking, right? So our maybe expected rewards will be the same. So the system will not distinguish ourselves, uh, the two of us based on our identities, right? And it's easy to see that, you know, the, this applies to permission systems in a sense that no permission system will be resource symmetric because it's permission, right? So if I'm out of the system, then regardless of how much resources I have, I'm not equal participant as one who is in the permission system. But it doesn't really apply to tell us the difference between, for example, proof of stake and proof of work. In both proof of stake and proof of work, uh, you would get uh, resource symmetry. What you don't get, as I will briefly argue later on, is this genuine openness in certain permissionless systems. So basically the, the property says that system cannot reach a state in which it is not open, in which it is not permissionless. So specifically a new participant uh, investment that would match an investment of existing participant must never depend on the action of the existing participants. And I think this is the property that captures uh, the very difference in decentralization between proof of stake and proof of work, which is important basically depending on the use case. So we always need to watch the use case. For some use cases, it's not important. For some use cases, it might be important. But basically, proof of work systems are inclusive. And this is what the paper continues to argue about. So basically, if me and George bring the same mining power into the system, we're going to have the same power and same expected rewards, right? And it's genuinely open. Like even if someone, imagine someone controlling the entire power in the Bitcoin mining, as computing power essentially grows outside the system, as we as humanity invent, uh, just have breakthroughs like busy beat, Moore's law, just, just the computing power, you know, historically, I cannot prove that it will continue like that, but I think the, it will be difficult to find uh, uh, computer scientists that don't agree that our computing power will actually continue to grow. Be it like, uh, you know, with parallel computing, with quantum computing, you name it, right? And that grows. And that computing power is free to join the system. And there is nothing the existing participants can do to prevent new participants uh, from joining the system. Uh, we can assume free, like, you know, for semiconductors, if we need to build and wait for, from China semiconductors, there is nothing that theoretically prevents you to build your own semiconductor facilities and so on, right? For the same investment. So just the rules of the game are, are kind of different from proof of stake. In proof of stake, there is resource symmetry, but there's genuine openness, not so much. And I think this captures this main difference. So if existing participants have 50% of the stake, assuming non-inflationary stake, and they're unwilling to sell, new participants can just not ever reach the existing participants' power. 
And in my opinion, this captures the difference, right? So it captures the difference that in the end, proof of stake systems are kind of more similar to permission systems in a sense that they can reach that, that state. Arguably some are not yet in that state, but if you're looking at the very long lead systems, like we are facing with decentralized systems and blockchains, this is a pretty fundamental difference. So, okay, I mean, again, we should evaluate the value of inclusiveness depending on the use case. And I would also argue that if Bitcoin use case is a payment system, uh, then it's not worth the energy that it's spending, right? So yeah, it's nice to have an inclusive payment system and maybe we can scale Bitcoin on layer two and other layers, but maybe inclusiveness is really not worth this energy that we are spending on Bitcoin. But what I'm proposing is to consider a different use case for Bitcoin because it's actually not a payment system. It was marketed as a, so it was marketed. It was basically in a, in a published, you know, white, Satoshi's white paper, it was called peer-to-peer -peer cash. And what happens if you think of Bitcoin as a decentralized money for humankind? So what happens if you imagine the world in which this becomes actually dominant money? So this is the thought experiment that I was talking to myself a few months ago, like a few months ago, and basically trying to imagine the world in which Bitcoin is the money. Just, just, just try to you know, make this thought experiment. And actually the results were for me at least profound that I decided to share it with the, with the community in this paper, right? So basically it needs to do with the current fiat monetary system. And I'm not going to talk about preferred players. So we know that you know, banks due, due to country on effect and so on are close to the source of money and, and these things. I think this is very well known. I want to talk about different incentives under the fiat monetary system and under the Bitcoin monetary system that actually are going to justify the energy expenditure of Bitcoin. So in Keynesian economics, these are basically I have, uh, this is the economics that basically the economic theory and one of the most famous economics that drives the, the monetary system that we have today and the, the economy research that we have today. And basically there are a few interesting quotes in the long run, we are all dead, which kind of suggests that nobody here is focusing on the long run. It also talks about silent deflation. This is, the, this is the citation in the lower left corner and so on. So economic growth is the key thing. So your business in order to be recognized, it needs to grow. You're measuring this growth in the fiat currency and you need to spend, right? So these are the characteristics that shouldn't be too strange for all of us in this current monetary system. So I try to summarize what happens in a, like one slide in the current monetary system. And definitely we have an inflationary system. So governments and central banks, they create money and commercial banks, they also create money because they don't have fractional reserve bank. Let's not go into re reasons like, is this justified or not, right? It might be justified. For example, we had COVID crisis, many businesses fail. Uh, governments maybe needed to print money. Let's not go into you know, good guys and bad guys, right? So, so it's just, just the, what happens in the system, right? So if you have an inflationary system and you have somebody who can print money, it turns out historically that they actually print money for one reason or another. What happens to incentives of people and businesses in, this, in such a system is because you have silent tax by inflation, people are incentivized is to do two things with the savings. So either to spend or invest. And if you invest into businesses, they basically need to grow again, measuring this fiat, which means that they get, need to get more revenues and more profits which basically promotes consumption and spending. So these, this is very like, like almost like first order logic and it goes with Keynesian economy well. So if you read basically the goal of Keynesian economy is to promote consumption and spending. And what we have is the economy is what we have today, right? And this is orientation to short-term profits and no long-term outlook. So basically, then this is my claim. I don't have a proof for this, right? But my claim is if 8 billion people live in this economy, then basically this is what causes over pollution and basically damaging the planet. And I would like just to ask you to look at a different thing. So let's look at the Bitcoin monetary system and its incentives. So in the Genesis book, there is an interesting motivation. I, I think all of you know this, but let's repeat it briefly. So in uh, basically when Kanti on effect showed last time, this was in 2008, basically there was a failure of uh, economic system and certain players were bailed out. These were the banks, right? This is the cover page of the times that Satoshi put into the Genesis block. And this is basically because governments were first bailing out the banks. And this is the effect of continuing effects. So people who are, people organizations who are close to money, they benefit from the money first and money is not evenly distributed, right? 
to all the people. The Bitcoin monetary policy, we have something else. And this, is, this didn't change since the inception of Bitcoin. So we have 21 million Bitcoin, which are divided in 100 million smaller units. And we have halving, basically 50% of all Bitcoin were mined in the first four years, then another 25% until 2016, then another 12.5% and so on. And uh, we are switching to Satoshi. So basically block reward will be less than Bitcoin in 2032. And last Satoshi will be mined in 2140. By the way, it's really interesting how someone comes, with, comes up with these uh, incentives until 2140, but that's a separate discussion that we might, you know, if we were at the conference, I would be happy to discuss during the coffee break, but very, very interesting. Supply over time, we are here, right? So we are like roughly at 90% of the, of the printed uh, Bitcoins. So there will be no more. So what are the incentives? Like we, we, we saw that the incentives in the current system are to spend. So what are the incentives in this system? So it may be seen as a volatile investment. If you look at comparison to fiat money, yes, yes, it's volatile. But if you just take the opposite look, of course, then fiat is volatile to Bitcoin. That's just a matter of perspective. We know this from, from Einstein, right? So just what's, what's your system of reference in these things? So, but what does it do on long term? And you can see this when you zoom out from the, from the price of Bitcoin compared to fiat currencies, when you zoom out, you see that it encourages long-term savings, but this argument is not necessary. So it's just if, because it's a closed system. So in Bitcoin, you trade, uh, you basically just transfer Bitcoins among the people who accept the game. And it's a closed system without any relation to the outside world in a sense. Uh, then as the network adoption grows, as more and more people adopt Bitcoin and you expect this to happen because people recognize the value, then the value of this Bitcoin grows. So it encourages, basically saving and holding. This is known as hodling. So some people don't, even if they don't think like that, usually, you know, because any one of us can trade and basically the, the hodling term was, came up as, uh, uh, this is actually a hilarious uh, uh, post on Bitcoin talk forum where, uh, where a kind of a bad trader calls himself a bad, bad trader and invents the term hodling. Uh, very interesting. But so if you hodl and save and your savings are not devalued over time, then as a human, you're incentivized to spend on things you need, as opposed to things you think you want in the fiat system. And because the savings are preserved uh, in time, there we get personal freedoms and time back. So essentially, you're not scared that if you worked and you saved in Bitcoin over time, you're not, you're not scared that somebody can devalue uh, this money. And basically, you're allowed to do with this, whatever you want. You're not forced, for example, to in invest in other economical players or, or in other businesses. For businesses, growth is practically meaningless. Like, can you grow your revenues infinitely in hard debt money? No, you cannot. So what you need to focus, especially since these customers now do, basically for them, this money is scarce. And if this is money for the whole humanity, they might not give it that easily as they do it now. So what businesses need to focus on is providing customers true value. And the success, arguably, is not going to be measured, or businesses in future, is not going to be measured in revenue or profits, because that doesn't make sense. Actually. It's going to be measured in the network effect, much like it, it is today for networks like Bitcoin, Ethereum, I would say Filecoin and others, right? So those that actually change and impact people's lives, they're more valued than others. So society changes completely. Right? So if 8 billion people are more incentivized towards savings as opposed to spending, you have basically the whole behavior of the whole species different. And basically I decided to bother you with this argument because I didn't hear it repeating much. And I, for me, this was the turning moment where I felt like, uh, like in Matrix basically waking up when I understood this. After I, would, I need to say I was not very smart. I looked at Bitcoin for 11 years, basically since it was invented. But this was the turning point for me. So equal opportunities of Bitcoin does, does not mean economic equality. We should be aware of that, right? So Bitcoin provides and proof of work provides economic uh, equal opportunities, but not necessarily economic equality. However, these economic inequalities are much easier to address in Bitcoin system than in current monetary system. So we have remittances as an example. So you don't need to go through uh, intermediaries to transfer money from wealthier members to, of the family to poorer ones. And this was one of the motivated use cases for El Salvador adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender just a month ago. 
If you have enough Bitcoin, like more than others, you can easily figure this out. And I challenge you to do this in fiat. And if you think it's, it's easy, if you have billion dollars, there are less fortunate countries in which billion of the local currency is not much. I was, I had an unluck, which I don't want to talk about much of holding actually a bill of 500 billion local dinners in my head. So that depends on like how lucky you are, where you're on the earth. But if you're in the non-inflationary monetary system, it's easy to see if you have more than others. If you have more than others, maybe you can give and donate and help other people. And also you can do Bitcoin proof of work mining anywhere on earth. Economies of scale apply. It's not easy to mine on laptop anymore. It was, by the way, it's not anymore. But now, you know, if El Salvador mines on a volcano like this guy started on geothermal energy, or if in Africa, very basically, I have a list here of renewable resources, they're actually spread across the planet very equally, unlike some other resources that we are relying on today, such as oil. So I would stop here and invite you to read the paper. And just to say that we need to think about things in a context. And Bitcoin is not a payment system. So Bitcoin is just the money, if it succeeds, it's, it's money for the humankind of the future, or otherwise it goes to zero. There, there are just two numbers for Bitcoin. Really. And the world in which Bitcoin becomes dominant money is actually a very nice world. How do we go about economy in that world is, might, might be a kind of a challenge, right? Because we don't know, the, we are afraid of deflationary economy. We might want to give governments the power to change. Uh, monetary policy and so on. The thing is, uh, there are economic theories about it. So in 1936, there was a paper by Henry Simmons from University of Chicago that was called Rules versus Authorities in Monetary Policy. And it was, uh, that's an amazing title, right? So it's definitely what Bitcoin does. And I find this reading uh, Friedrich Hayek. So Friedrich Hayek is an Austrian school economist, uh, Nobel Memorial Prize, like the fake a Nobel Prize in Economy uh, winner from 1974 for his, uh, for his works. And the Constitution of Liberty from 60s actually talks a lot about welfare state in the deflationary economy. So I recommend this reading. And basically he claims that arguments advanced by Simons in 1936 are so strict, this is a quotation that I use in my paper, are so strong, the arguments, that the issue is now largely on how far it is practically possible to tie down monetary authority by appropriate rules. But notice, like nobody has, again, nobody's bad, nobody's good. Let's, let's take this position. It was not possible before. If we have seashells as, a, as money, somebody would bring more seashells. If we have stones, somebody wouldn't bring more stone. If we have gold, somebody would bring more gold. If we have fiat money on, as paper money, somebody would bring more paper money. If you didn't have technological solution to prevent somebody bringing more money until Bitcoin. So basically now you have. So there is a technological solution in which you cannot possibly attack. I mean, you can double spend if now comparing to the power of nation states, right? So you need a, somebody who controls more energy than Poland to double spend the coin. But as we know, you cannot change the supply even if you do that. So even against the most powerful attackers, you cannot change the, in the presence of most powerful attackers, you cannot change the, the, the monetary policy. And I think as a humanity, we should use this because as a technology, we have a solution to the problem, which was discussed in 30s. We should think about this in that perspective from my, in my opinion. So what I propose next is basically to embrace Bitcoin as the money of the future because it's good for humankind and planet Earth. And I try to argue there are more arguments in the paper. The question going back to decentralized computing is what do we do now? So I'm definitely supporting research on reducing energy expenditure, but without trade-offs. So, okay, if we have proof of stake, that might be useful, but not for layer one. It might be useful for something else. Let's use it where it's useful. For layer one, if we want to improve Bitcoin, let's not focus on trade-offs. Let's not sacrifice security and decentralization. Let's find something that's not weaker, if not stronger than Bitcoin, or prove some impossibility results here. For other things, until we do that, let's leverage Bitcoin slow, but very secure proof of work consensus to secure the rest of decentralized internet. Because if there is no nation state that can attack effectively, maybe except few, but not, maybe not for a long time, I mean, like in future, uh, let's leverage that security to help with security of other parts of this big decentralized system that we're building. And in that context, I'm inviting you, I'm, I'm almost out of time, but I will invite you to essentially continuation of the talk is, in some sense, 
where Sarah Azumi tomorrow in the checkpointing session will talk about securing membership and stake checkpoints of Byzantine fault torrent and proof of stake blockchains by anchoring them into Bitcoin. So basically what Sarah will describe is the idea that we have and that we are building and I'm inviting anyone interested to join in the context of our open collaboration, of course. Uh, basically anchoring membership and hash of the like checkpoints of the state of a proof of stake network in the taproot enabled, taproot is important when it kicks in in November, in a taproot enabled Bitcoin. And we, for example, if we need to store uh, the actual state somewhere, proof of stake network could build its own content addressable storage or use Filecoin and IPFS. And by this, you can easily prevent, easily, well, under quotation marks, prevent long range attacks that are also some, one other thing that's basically plugged in proof of stake. So this is tomorrow, uh, 5 p.m. UTC presented by Sarah. I really invite you to join this talk. So basically, now our sharding. Uh, in our back to consensus love goals in our sharding uh, scheme maybe we do checkpoints of you know uh, this top level consensus into bitcoin but we continue scaling like leverages and security for bitcoin with continuous scaling all the other again coming back and finishing all the other talks and sessions that we have in consensus days are very very relevant right so essentially we have today sharding then we have scaling and performance we have stronger security and the final session will be on peer-to-peer -peer communication and efficient mempools. Tomorrow we have the session on checkpointing that I already discussed and basically on eventual consistency and so on. So I'm again, thanking you so much for these contributions. I think this is really important. I think these are uh, really interesting as individual contributions and I would invite you whenever you hear the talk to think how we can use it in the context of a global decentralized system, right? And there will be no mark or no protocol labs, no, no, anyone to tell, but like we need to work and collaborate as a community towards this, but we have, we need to have high level goals in mind, like really important goals and basically uh, these goals. So let's build a future that decentralized, collaborative and good for humanity. So with this advertisement of our group and basically uh, the announcement that we are also growing and hiring, I can take some questions. Thank you so much for, for, for your attention. I hope this was interesting. If controversial, that was also the goal. Uh, so in the, gen in the definition of genuine openness for proof of stake, uh, the antecedent was that, that the person who is holding the non-inflationary token, they might not sell it to the other person, the newcomer. But, yes. uh, but uh, by not selling it isn't, that person depreciating the value of the token and harming itself? Like, should there be some crypto economics flavor in the definition of genuine openness? That's my question. Uh, maybe as you will see the definitions are in English. I think not. I think there is a fundamental thing still. I am encouraging also in the paper formalization of what's going on here. The main difference that I want to highlight, if I'm holding 50% of the state and I'm not willing to sell it, that's whatever is my motivation, even if this thing depreciates, that's different from me holding 50% of the mining power and not be able to do anything to prevent you from bringing the same amount of mining power in proof of work, if you see the difference. Yeah, that difference is clear, but the consequences are like, uh, the consequences are not accounted. Like if you are not, uh, like if you don't allow someone to take part in the uh, uh, staking process by uh, leaving, get, giving them the stake on, in the market, then uh, that stake will devalue and there is no point for in the, in, there is no incentive in from, from Alice perspective to do that action in itself, right? It's open. I wouldn't answer this. It requires deeper economic analysis. For me, it was sufficient to see that there was a difference. Okay. Fundamental one. So yes, I agree that proof of work is definitely more inclusive than proof of stake. But what I wonder about is about the symmetrical, because well, we can already see that there's a tendency of there's energy prices are very different in certain regions in the world. So that me in a certain place, I me investing the same money into it won't have the same result as someone else where the energy prices are significantly lower. And Obviously, someone already holding a lot of hardware when the GPU prices were not as insanely high as currently also had had to have invest significantly less than I might have to invest now as the prices increased. I, absolutely, absolutely right. I did have a disclaimer that I that I sneaked in, which I was assuming for proof of work a fair market for energy and computing power, to just to make the argument. 
it's a bigger thing. So of course, in, uh, you can also say, yeah, but it takes me time to produce the semiconductors and so on. There are different, there are different ingredients to the game. I completely agree. Which still doesn't. So at the fundamental level, if you imagine like the ideal world, like if, if you simulate this, if you're building a game in which you simulate this, right? So you, basically, you would have clear difference between proof of stake and proof of work as games. And of course, in our world, there are different economic parameters that play into and that essentially impact the calculation a bit, whether what we want to calculate. But in my opinion, they don't impact the fundamental difference between the two games. Yeah, but fundamentally, there's a, a big difference between the two, yes. Yeah. I, I had a, a second small question, which was to a later point in the terms of the money spending in compared fiat to cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Where, from from my experience in, in different crypto communities, I've seen like people being more more likely to spend cryptocurrency on all kinds of things, being it pyramid schemes, NFTs, games, gambling, completely random stuff compared to fiat, like. Uh, that's that's the thing. So so I'm not saying everyone is incentivized to save, right? It's just that if you're if each of one of us is incentivized a bit to so I mean these people in order to make that argument, you need to say that these people who are gamblers in the cryptocurrency world wouldn't be gamblers in the fiat world. And I don't think this is the case, right? I, I think that like if you look at individuals, if they actually save a bit more resources in one world compared to other, they don't need to do it relatively to each other, but just compared to themselves, to their copy in another world. And you multiply that by 8 billion, you're going towards this conclusion. 